Well, hello everybody, I'm Chuck Offenberger. I'm on the board of the Greene County Historical Society. Down at the end of our row of guests here is Jerry Roberts. Jerry's an old retired newspaper or radio news director. I'm an old newspaper man and we over a half a dozen years have had these history chats at the Greene County Fair. We've covered all kinds of topics. Uh, sometimes we have an audience of one or two, sometimes we've had an audience of 30. So we never know. But we went, we introduced various topics and then uh, uh, air them out and get questions from the audience or observations from the audience. And it's kind of a fun way to do history. We, you know, we learn a lot doing it this way. And also, I have to say, often sets the stage for later programs by the Historical Society because we get ideas here that will pop out that we have not had before. Um, I am, have got my Rippy Iowa sesquicentennial ball cap on you for the coolest. Because we're here today to talk about Rippy at sesquicentennial time plus one. Uh, and we're going to open our program this morning the way we should when we have it available. Is we're all going to sing the Rippy High School fight song. There we go, Nance. There we go. We're going to sing. This is the, to the tune of the Minnesota Rouser. So here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Hail to Rippy, hats off to thee, to our colors true we will ever be, firm and strong united are we. Rah, 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 rah. hail to the Rippy High. There's a chant. R, R, I, T, P, E, Y. And then you sing the song again. Rippy, Rippy, Rippy. Rippy. It, uh, we should ask, it mentions the school colors. What are, where, where are the school colors? Purple and gold. Purple and gold. And the nickname, the team's nickname. The Bulldogs. The Bulldogs, the Rippy Bulldogs. Well, thank you all. Thank you, for, especially our special guest from Rippy. If, if we cannot get good stories out of these three, there's something wrong with Jerry. Because you can't get three more informed, better storytellers out of Rippy Iowa than these three. Do we get paid for the ones we shouldn't tell? <laughs> well, we'll pay you to tell them. But that was Nancy Bardol Hanneman, uh, is with us, and her cousin, right? Yes. Cousin Roy Bardol, right here, well known farmer in the Rippy area. And Mary Weaver, it's a farmer east of Rippy, uh, just across the Green Boone County line, but Rippy's always been home. so. Thank you all for coming. Um, Jerry, jump in here anytime you want to start, but I, we should start by saying this is about we're saluting Rippy at the time of the Sesame Centennial, so tell, give us a briefing on the celebration coming up. Okay, uh, we are really celebrating 150 plus 16 because uh -huh. old Rippy uh -huh. down uh -huh. along the river, and there is a cemetery there near old Rippy, the former old Rippy, and it was uh, there, as just the early pioneers came to Greene County. As 16 years later, the railroad was coming into Greene County, and the whole town picked up and moved to the new Rippy, and interestingly enough, it was called New Rippy until back in about the late 50s, when they decided they could call it just Rippy. <laughs> and uh, so the celebration is Saturday, July 31st. Correct. To so give us a briefing, Nancy, on or, or Roy, on what's going to happen that day, what do people expect, why should they come down to Rippy that day? Uh, it starts at 10 o'clock in the parade, the lineup is at 9, and then it part of the parade, let us know and we'll get the information to you. Uh, among other things, there will be a car show at the street dance, uh, fireworks at 9.30, and that's part of the tradition that there were always fireworks after the 4th of July and uh, baseball games, and some people about that blew up and came up. <laughs> um, let's see what else is uh, Activities for kids, uh, bubble magic thing, um, Face painting, painting. Yeah. Yeah. And we are, you're doing this in 2021. You aimed at 2020, actually. Uh, how deep, how, uh, of course, the pandemic forced it to be postponed a year, but how deep did you get into toward the celebration before it was postponed? Do you remember in 2020? I think we decided in about 
October of 2020 that we we just weren't very no that's 2019. Right, October of 2019 that we couldn't have it. Uh -huh. uh, so, but we had done a, a lot of the planning and some of it was, was able to carry forward. Uh, Rippy, the name. Roy. Yeah, Mr. Rippy. Judge Rippy. Um, I've got his name here, J.M. Rippey, Judge J.M. Rippey. Do you know much about him? Uh, I don't know. I just know Rippey's name after Rippey. Yeah, he surveyed Green County. He didn't ever actually live there. And one of the signs around the square is about Judge Rippey. Up here on the Brown yeah. County. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes, he is. Yeah. It's a interesting looking. Is it a, a mausoleum or is it a grave? I can't remember. It's a, it's a notable it's a stone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. But certainly an important person in the early history of Green County. I wonder if he surveyed other towns in the county too. I, in fact, didn't he was involved in surveying part of Jefferson? Wasn't he? I think. Okay. But he was in the Civil War. I don't think he went down to So old Rippy <coughs> is. Uh, I've got him from a cheat sheet here that Nancy provided me in 1849. His first settler is somewhere right around in there. To old Rippy, and again. How, Mary, did you mention that how far it was Old Rippy from the site of the town today? About three and a half miles, um, and it's south and west uh, of the current town of Rippy. And was it, did you say right down on the river? No. Not on the river? Not long. But close. Almost stone still. Uh -huh. The last house was destroyed probably 10, maybe 15 years. Wow. That was actually part of Old Rippy's big old house. When the, uh, do you have any knowledge uh, of when they moved the town, when the railroad came to the site of the new town, right? Uh, when they moved, did they move buildings or was it just people? I mean, moved buildings too. I'm sure there was lots of buildings moved with horsepower. Wow. That's, that's the hard way to do it. Yeah. That's what they had. Do we know? Are there any buildings from Old Rippy still standing in New Rippy? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, that of doesn't the, make it so. Uh -huh. yeah. Some of the buildings also. We're sticking with your story. <laughs> <laughs> from an old mining town that was between Angus and Rippy, there was a lot of coal mines there. And uh, that was a town called Surrey. And a lot of the buildings came to New Rippy from the town of Surrey. Surrey. Yeah. Was that a Green County town? Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm because Eisenhower. Angus was right on the border, right? Right. Okay, in the southeast corner of the county, right? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, it's amazing to think of that time. I remember a uh, slag pile there just north of the elevator office that was uh, coal mine. I think they were all strip mines there where it was. Well, uh, what was the foundation of Rippy? I mean, what? I guess we start with old Rippy. What was? What? Why was the town organized right there? And then why was the railroad, of course, moving? But what were the industries there? Azor Mills was this, the professor or the teacher at the school. And do you have any idea why it was named the Brand School? I don't. Probably the family that owned the land. And yeah, I imagine so. And was this in Old Rippy? 
Mm -hmm. Are there pictures of that school or drawings? I have to look myself, and you see it if you look at the flat map, but I, I do not see a picture of the school. There's a description of it, talking about how it's made out of walnut, uh, but that was so prevalent that that wasn't really as exciting and as exotic as we think about walnut now. Did the, uh, did the mining dry up? Uh, I know that there was a, a great population uh, down in the southeast corner because of the mining with the Angus and, and Rippey and, and, and Surrey and those places down there. Was it that the miner dried up and all of a sudden the people left because there wasn't any work or, or was it some other way? It was a combination. It depended on the mine. But one of the mines around Angus, there was uh, some kind of labor dispute. And also, the, the coal around here is not the, was not it's the highest very farm. soft, high sulfur. And so, um, once, uh, as, as more coal deposits were, were found in the western part of the country, that became less valuable coal. But from, um, this is a picture of one of the open pit mines around Rippey. Uh, it was named, name, uh, owned by, uh, uh, okay. Bud I didn't know they had pit mines. Uh, yeah. yeah. And what did they get filled in, or are they, those pits still there? They filled in. Yeah. yeah. This was water, though. I mean, yeah. they, they, they didn't fill them back in with soil. They just oh. accumulated water. What's your memory? How big would those be? I mean, were they swimming pool size or bigger? Bigger. Oh, bigger. bigger. This this one was operated from 1933 to 1942, and. Uh, Two of the mines around Rippey both have tragic stories. This is one of them. One of Bud McElhinney's a nephew or someone backed too close to the mine and came out into the truck. And that person died, and sometime after that it was closed. And the biggest mine around Rippey was the Green County Mine, which is the one. And it's the shaft. Yeah, yeah. And the, there, there was a program on it, the, the people thing or whatever they call it. Was, and, and there was, there was. Uh, miles and miles of... of uh, it's amazing to think about that. Was, am I remembering right? Was this the mine that had the mules down in yeah, it? That, that, yeah. And wow. uh, that mine probably would have not had too many more years left anyway, but in 1947, um, the, well, the, the real story I found out from, from uh, Andrew Zanotti's grandson was that the, the elevator thing that went up and down. There was a big log that was attached to it. That broke and fell down and hit Andrew Zanotti and the mine owner. And they either died immediately or, or shortly thereafter. And, and that um, and that mine was closed in 47, which I think was the same year as uh, the mine. Guys, I've got to be careful here. That seems like it was recent history, but it, it actually... <laughs> you must be careful here. <laughs> That's 70 some years ago. Jed, well, yeah. another, another question. <clears throat> I've examined a lot of abstracts for Green County, and a, especially a lot of them in, in Grand Junction, where the abstracts would show tunnels under the town, in town. Is there something like that in Ripley? Tunnels in town? I don't believe so. For coal, you mean? Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I see on that. I, I, I think see all that. the mines in Ripley were, were strip mines from the surface. I don't think there were any shadows. Well, I would see them in abstracts from Grand Junction. That's interesting. Oh. Did, do you ever run into, well, Roy, you're out there in the field all the time. I mean, do you ever run into coal today that was cut back in that time? Uh, the well at, that I grew up with, uh, when it was drilled, it went through a vein of coal about that. Street. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, this would be spread out all over quite a territory. Well, see, we're a mile and a half, I suppose, from the chat. And it, the coal just, as they went further into the veins, the veins got narrower and narrower, and more difficult and more difficult. If you could think of being a miner down in there in a vein that wasn't but about that thick, with a pick, that's not a fun job. Oh, man. That's Hard not work. a fun job. Well, so the pioneers who came from, did they come from any one spot? Some from Illinois. Our 
Um, and did they, when I suppose when they came, they weren't, it would have been hard to classify them as farmers or miners or railroad workers at first anyway. They probably, they were just trying to survive. They were farmers. Right? Farmers? Yeah. So they, would they have started planting crops right away when they got there just to at least get food going? The, uh, the 160 that I call home was bought in 1901 by Bill, my great granddad, and my granddad, Nate. Uh, Bill's wife's name was Eliza. That's the marker. That's the marker. Wow. And they moved, had moved from Pennsylvania. They hesitated in Illinois. Bill was a little bit of a scoundrel. And they bought and sold and bought and sold. And when uh, they bought the whole farm, Eliza said, Now, Bill, I moved last time. And I'm going to sell that to the lid. <laughs> well, there was a neighbor, Harry Holmes, lived in the northeast corner of that 160. And Bill and, and uh, well, the two girls like to drink together a lot. And Bill Holmes, Harry Holmes, uh, convinced Bill Bardo to sell him five acres out of the northeast corner. But when he came home and told his wife, to say his wife was unhappy, he gross understatement. <laughs> and the story goes that Bill spent a couple weeks on the Davenport <coughs> over that sale just as an emphasis point that it will not happen again. It takes a person secure in their heritage to describe one of their ancestors as somewhat of a scoundrel. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's but we all have them. There's the story of Bill and his horse. He had a blind horse, he had a work horse, and he used it and it went blind. He put it up for sale. And somebody come to look at it. Uh, Bill says, yeah, that's a pretty good horse. Oh, Bill says, just don't look good. Just don't look good. <laughs> oh, no, it looks pretty good to me. It stands well on its feet and so on. They finally struck a deal and Bill put the money in his pocket. And the other fellow went home with the horse. And the next day, the other guy came back. And he said, you sold me a blind horse. I told you it didn't look good. <laughs> So he was a horse trader. That's kind of where this counted. And I assume, Nancy, that's, you were talking your kin, too, there, going back to Bill Bardo. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Mary, what was your family's heritage over there? You, you're married into the Weavers, but what was your maiden name? Uh, my maiden name was Doris, just like a person's first name, except it had two R's, T-O-R-R-I-S. And um, my grandmother, uh, had a, a tough life, I, I think. Well, almost all the pioneers and early settlers did. Her husband um, died of tuberculosis, and she had several children, and they all moved to Colorado thinking that it would help his tuberculosis ailment. But of course it didn't. He went ahead and, and passed away. And so then they came back, and they were trying to be farmers, and um, bought some 80 acres, and. My father has vivid stories about how they got that paid for by taking in borders and doing the laundry. And, and he, he had a vivid description about they had to run the washing machine, not with gasoline, but with power by turning the crank. And his mother had a, a little branch, and if he didn't keep the crank going, she swatted his calves of his legs. So they had a tough time, I think, financially wow. doing that. Are they, where did they, where had they come from? They were originally from uh, England uh, and then had come to the U.S. and then, you know, started farming. Uh-huh. So. And how about the Weavers? Oh, I don't think I'm going to be a very good storyteller about that. Can't help. Okay. But were they native to Ribby area? The no, area? they were born from the Junction Bay oh. area. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, I want to go back to the brand school. For oh, I got time. something I want to tell you about that. Too. Okay, but my question is, uh, do we have uh, thirty people went to war? 
the Civil War. Um, can you go back and find that coverage of that in the early, early newspapers or anything? Oh, you can. Uh, one of H. E. Stillman's books. Um, uh -huh. Those are those wide history books that have uh, lots of personal history and family history, but then also history about the county. Um, and they're listed the people that went off to the Civil wow. War. With I'll bet that's the 1912 history. I, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Did we have any uh, victims or? Oh, lots. lots. Really? Lots, lots died? Lots died. Some from injuries in the war and some from disease. And Azar Mills himself was injured with a ball striking his arm and then he was paralyzed in his arm. He was able to return it and was really a, a good leader for Green County, uh, but uh, was injured. The story I have to tell you about Azar Mills, there were two, and, and the Brand School, there were two regiments that were uh, going off to the Civil War from Greene County. The one from Jefferson was um, well stocked in terms of uniforms and uh, precision and being able to do things very, very well. And the Brand School was more farmers and they were poor. They had uniforms, but they had been constructed at home. But many of them did not have boots. And so they were going to do a performance on July 4th of 1861 here in Jefferson in front of the courthouse. And many of the brand school people did not want to come because they didn't have boots. So the local doctor, Dr. Lovejoy, suggested to them they paint their feet black. And they did. And they came and were applauded and really recognized because they did their maneuvers so well. So I Amazing. love that story, showing about the initiative and the, uh, how, how hardy people were at that point. <coughs> Honestly, I mean, uh, Greene County Historical Society, we're, we're doing our best at telling the stories of history, but it, have we done that story justice, the brand school story? My goodness. I mean, we probably mentioned it many times, and it almost seems like that should be a painting or a sculpture or something. That's, that's heroic. It's pretty amazing. And they, they were young. From 10 25, to 25. 10 to 25. It's almost un, unspeakable, isn't it? I mean, you think about that in terms of comparing that to anything today. And how they paint, though, and some of them were coming as far as five miles. And they, you know, they were probably coming on horseback. They didn't have cars to travel five miles. So they were very committed. Jerry, let's jump forward. And let's then, talk and one, one more okay. story. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. About those who came back. Civil War. And I I terribly apologize because I could not bring the names back. But there were two men. One of them was on Sherman's march to the sea. And that said this fellow had a big, big voice. And when he sang the song Sherman's March to the Sea, there was no question but what that word he said. Wow. He had, it was loud and long. The other, the other man was a very, very short. As Dad described, he probably not a midget, but really close. And his statement was when he was uh, chided for being short, many men were killed by the bullets that went over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, I mean, how, how old are you two, Mary? How, are you in your 70s? I'm the youngest. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 76. Okay. I'm 75. Do you, do you three remember Civil War veterans around there? No, Can you? Our fathers do. They used to be in the Memorial Day parades, and Ashley Free was one of them. I'm not sure if he was one of the last in Green County. He was one of the last in Green County. Okay, now let's jump forward. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Uh, my great grandfather was in one of those units, and he and Isaac Brown were friends. And this is kind of a unique story. Isaac Brown, uh, it was John B. John, and, and Isaac Brown was married to Hannah Brown. And Hannah Brown, uh, Isaac Brown, was killed in the Battle of Champion Hill. And my grandfather stayed in the unit uh, for a couple more years and was wounded 
uh, where I don't know what the exact history of that was, but he made it back to Ripley. Uh, he was a young man and he made it back to Ripley. And Isaac Brown and Hannah Brown had a child, a girl, and uh, her name was, uh, I don't remember her name, but anyway, my uh, great grandfather was single at that time, and he married Hannah Brown after they got, after they came back from, after he uh, got back from the Civil War. Wow. He married Hannah Brown, and uh, so then the story continues from there. Uh, let's set the stage for talking about uh, life from, you know, uh, in, after the post-war and, you know, as the mining is starting up. But let, we're going to go to the, into modern times, too. What is the population of Ripley today? And do, how does that compare with any all-time high? Do you remember? Two, 210 now. 600 was the highest. Wow. Would that have been in the... 40s, 50s, or before, 20s or 30s. And there were 40 Italian Italian people in Italy through the middle 1940s. Zanotti family. Uh, Zanotti. Zanotti. Uh, were the last ones. Uh, Fagotti. Uh, uh, apparently, in, in the Ripley alumni, not many stayed through the finish school, so they were moving where the mines were more I was going to say that was mining, wasn't it? Because yeah. if you look down to Granger, there's a whole community still of, yeah. of uh, Italian names. Were there other ethnic uh, groups that were represented in that early period? Uh, English. English? A few Germans sprinkled in. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, let's, let's start in about, oh, the, let's say 1900 and coming forth. Uh, must have been uh, tremendous development as far as agriculture's you know, systems and everything starting to, we moved from, I'm assuming we moved in that era from beyond sustenance, sustenance farming, subsistence. subsistence farming to actually marketing grain and animals and everything. Am I right on that? Yeah. Primarily because a lot of highway was done. It was very swampy land. Um, and there's a wonderful excerpt in the history of Rippy about uh, when they would go east of town on his pony, and I, I can't tell you who wrote it, but how you would have to skirt the pond because it was so small. Old Jim Andrew, uh, who was Mr. History in this county for years and years, I think he died in 2014, but Old Jim Andrew told me, I pushed him one time in an interview, but what's the most important thing that ever happened in Green County? And he said, Tyler. And he said, the reason I say that is because had that not happened, uh, we would be farming about one-third the nine land we are yes. today. Yes. Uh, so nobody would be here. It's all marshland. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And actually, in old maps, there's high ground that's noted in it. And actually, it used to be trails where the Indians would, would uh, go because it wasn't marshland. It was just a little higher, and that was some of the trails that they would follow. So we had a railroad in Ripley. Okay. Go back. To, let, I'm sorry. To yeah. Run. No, I'd no, like do. to go back to the stagecoach. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good point. The, the Des Moines Sioux City stage line went across my whole 160. You go out to Pleasant Hill Cemetery, and there are two places where you can still still see the tracks. Uh, I had a, a daughter-in-law that visited this spring, and they asked me, well, where did they ford the river? And I had to think about it. They went to Jefferson. They didn't ford the river. They stayed on the east side of the river until they got some further up. Uh -huh. uh, the stage livery was in the northwest corner of our not our 160, but across the road north. And are we talking, where are we talking from current Rippy today? West. Okay. West. Section, section 5. 82, section, uh, section 5, 82. Um, did that there's operate a, like a, a bus line? I mean, could you buy a ticket and go to the city? Yeah. Amazing. It was a livery across on 
our land on that home farm, there was a big cottonwood tree in the north in that corner. And that's where they hobbled the horses when they stayed overnight and fed them hay. And Dad talked about when he started farming and they had to chew apart. There was always a big grain of weeds around where that <laughs> I mean, the fertile land there. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, if you go south from Red like you're going to Dawson, past the cemetery, and the road curves around, and if you go straight another 100 feet, there used to be stagecoach tracks there. Wow. And somebody plowed them up a few years ago. But always I drive down. Gondors or whatever, and I see yeah. those tracks. It is, it is amazing now that Pleasant Hill Cemetery, you mentioned yeah. everyone, uh, you can see those pa that path of those tracks, and they're marked. There's a couple of markers there, so if yeah. you find them, you'll know you're seeing the right thing out there. It's, yes. It really is something to see that. Um, so, oh, let, let me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't quite finish thoughts, and then they come back. Yeah, I guess that's a sign of age. <laughs> If you stand in the northwest corner of that 160, when their ground is bare, you look across it and you can very vividly see where the stagecoach would have ran because they didn't run in the sloops. They ran on, on the ground, yeah, sure. in between and across the course, and it, the, the line literally meandered from the point to, to Sioux City as much as possible out of very pocket. Do we have any idea how long that went on? You know, I did. I it was like three years. I think it was about all the Jerry, did you have something? No, I was just, uh, we started talking about uh, Thailand and all. And uh, that started around 1914, I believe, is when uh, some of the Thailand was, or at least Sounds right. uh, most of it did. And uh, it's gotten to now over 600 different districts in the county. In the county, wow. And uh, only a handful are, uh, I guess, governed by the farmers. Uh, most of them have handed that job over to the supervisors right. you know, as uh, the, the supervisors. If it is the, a district, it is the supervisor's responsibility. Well, there was, yeah, I guess, officially a, a district that yeah. they, they advocate, the, the farmers advocate, say it's yours now, that's what happened. Um, you know, you look at Rippy today, you think of the story about the railroad coming through. What what railroad was it that came through? Is that in the same yeah. Yeah. In, in the same yeah. yeah. It's connecting down to Des Moines and on to St. Louis. When Dad had his, had his appendix out. Uh, Mark and Bell on the train with them in Des Moines, and they rode to Des Moines, got off the train. Dad had his appendix for his tonsils out, and Grandma and Doc Martin and Dad came home and was back in the They do the surgery down there? Mm -hmm. So the doc went with it? Amazing. There was a passenger service up through sometime in the uh, I assume a lot of ag products. Livestock moved on that train here on that railroad. Uh, you, but you see today, you know, you're down there and you're kind of, it's amazing to look at those elevators. Uh, you know, I mean, I love the track across from one to the other that's got the American flag yeah. sitting right over the road that's become a real landmark. How did that develop, or when did that develop, those the co ops and the elevators? With, are we talking early? Early? 20s? Do we have a lot of sinkholes down around Ripley because of those mines? 
Don't we have one? Don't I remember a story from some other program that out there, maybe east and just a little north of the road, somebody had one out there that they put cars down in to fill it up? <laughs> so yeah, there's a few, there's a few sinkholes around. And I mean, it was big enough to have a car dealership when you're talking about two. In the 1950s, there were two car dealers, two grocery stores, two banks, two gas stations. Uh, it's a great story about the Rippy Banks, and Nancy will yield to you to tell it since your father was involved. Well, the, the First National Bank always advertised themselves as the oldest bank in Green County. However, uh, as I started reading some of the history after my dad was not around, I found the story a little bit different. Uh, the First National Bank was, was, had two or three predecessor banks that started in the 1880s. Thus, they traced their money from that. And sometime in the early 1900s, a man by the name Suyan, S-U-Y-H-A-N, or something, his name, I, we haven't had a picture of him yet. He owned one of the banks, uh, and then a uh, younger guy owned one of the other banks, and he married Suyan's daughter, and so that became, I don't know, the commercial bank or something. And in 1905, I think February of 1905, uh, the First National Bank came to exist with that name, and there were state banks and national banks, and then you got your charter from one or the other. Uh, the savings bank started in March or April of 1905, so technically, yes, the First National Bank was older, but not by much. Um, and the two banks in and, and Rippey were the only two banks in Green County that opened up right away after bank holiday. Okay, we should explain briefly that bank holiday was at times the federal government shut down all banking. Because everyone was failing. Yes. And, and they, their plan was to close, readjust, get ready, and open back up. Yeah. And the, but the fact is, only two banks in Greene County ever opened back up. Right, up, right away. No, there, and there was a period of time that Jefferson didn't have any operating banks. Which is some, An slight, amazing some story. slight source of pride to the Ricky Banks. <laughs> <laughs> slight. slight. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so the, the, and the banks were at one point, and this my dad told me I didn't ever check it out, it was the smallest town in the country that had two independent banks. Mm -hmm. With the assets. Yeah. Yeah. Which were probably reflected by the farm community around. Yeah. And, and people that traded with both banks would continue to do so when they when they traveled away. Uh, two of the other bank children are over here. <laughs> North, three. 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 Uh, Carol and I are just a year apart, and we always called our dad's bank the other bank. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Let's start into, Jerry, you pick this up here, and let's start, start into some school stories, size of the school and all that. And while we're doing that, I'm going to slip around and shoot a couple of pictures. So pick it up and take our offer. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the schools and then that wonderful thing called reorganization. <laughs> but uh, I remember East Green, and if I'm not mistaken, they were the East Green Hawks. Is that it? Yeah. And then the Rippy Bulldogs. But there was that time when then they merged and they still held on to the Hawks name. They, yeah. They didn't defer to a third name or anything. Was was there quite a rivalry between Rippy and, and East Green? Was that, yes. no, 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 a little bit about it. Rip, yes. Rippy and Grand Junction definitely, yeah. As, yeah. as happened in many cases by about the third year of the Reorganization occurred the first school year was uh, 62, 63, no, 61, 62. No. 62 was the last year. No, 62. I graduated in 61, so yeah, 60, 60, 62, 62, 62. Oh my God, we've got something coming. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated in 61 too. I must have. I, I just remember Squirrel Hollow being a, a, a destination point for seniors that want to drink here. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrel Hollow was quite the thing. And by, by now, since you're a senior, you can go there to drink beer. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> With, within probably three or four years, the kids were fine. The people from Rippy <clears throat> Grand Junction and Dana were still going. This was a Rippy kid. That was a Grand Junction kid. If my kid had been here, they would have been higher in the ranking or something. But the Oh, there was intense rivalry with all the schools in Greene County, and, and 
particularly baseball and basketball. Yes. Rippy was so big in baseball, and that's a, oh, yeah. a sport we haven't talked about as much. But apparently, they didn't have enough for a football team. We didn't right. want. A, we didn't want. Oh, a you team. didn't want a football team. <laughs> And, and what about basketball? How, how great was the Ripley oh, basketball? Oh, quite one of the, the best Ripley stories was in 1955. Uh, this was the last year that every, all the schools were in one class. The Ripley team with Dan Peters, uh, Camp Burrow, um, Fort Homer. Fort Homer. Uh, I'm not remembering the other people right now. I want to hear this. 55, we're talking. Nine, yeah, okay. we're, we're undefeated. They were mopping up everybody. So they get to the finals of the sub-state, and guess who they play? Ames High School. Uh, they played in the, what, what was the old field house? Or whatever they played. Yeah. Old yeah. Army. 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 Uh, I remember as about a fifth or sixth grade kid walking in there with my parents and figuring if I got lost, I would never find my way. <laughs> uh, the, the baskets with no walls behind them for a starter. And Phil Roberts, one of our Boston Ruby residents, said they didn't. Phil was in high school at the time. He said they didn't tell the Rippy team that they were supposed to bring their own water. <laughs> Plus, of course, Rippy had never had a chance to practice in this kind of a, of a auditorium. And they played, uh, this is my brother who's a few years older, they played pretty evenly through the first three quarters. And Rippy's center was Dan Peters, who was about, about six long, maybe. The Ames center was 6'5 six, or 6'6 six, six, and went on to play college or NBA or something. So of course the local barber shop. The next year they went to classes. So the local barber shop chat was if only they had done that the year before, Rippy would have made it to the state tournament. <laughs> and the basketball team did in 1927, but nobody remembered that. Did they have uh, county tournaments? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, because because that was a big deal when I was in, in high school and grade school moving up, but because there was enough schools to rack it all. Yeah, there were eight high schools. Yeah. So. So how did Ricky do with the, you're talking about 55, but on, on It depended on which year, Jerry. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you didn't have a juggernaut then, you kind of yeah. had an off and on kind of, uh, yeah. that's what most small towns are. You have done, uh, you folks in Ribby have done this fantastic renovation, restoration of the ballpark as part of them getting ready for the centennial, or the centennial celebration, and it's, that ballpark is just one of the gems of not only Green County, but of baseball across Iowa. Yeah. Mel, um, Mel Merkin was really the, yeah. the genesis yeah. of that. And he was, uh, he coached the East Green for about two or three years, and then he went to Anthony and was there for 30 some years. Hall of Fame coach. I think, he, coach. I think he had 42 years coaching or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, Which is it? Oh, baseball's, baseball's uh, story. We were in marching band. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, we had to practice in the around the schoolhouse wasn't big enough, so we had to go down to the high to the ballpark to practice, particularly in that field, which is full of garter schools. Oh, the bears on the front were trying to stay in line. And uh, <laughs> sorry, did you say wrong? I said there's a reason they call it snake crit. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, the. Uh, I had a, uh, my first knowledge of Rippy when I was a little kid was I had a brother-in-law, Bob Watson, who played, was from Des Moines Roosevelt, played cop for the UNI, or it was I had Iowa State Teachers College, Panthers, six foot five, great big guy, and he was a catcher. And he got hired at Rippy when he was like a sophomore in college to come run the little league program or the kids program, baseball program. And then part of his job was playing for the Rippy Merchants, I think they were at the time town team in Blade, and I always thought that, that was intriguing, but I learned later um, that Rippy hosted on that little field, looking a lot like it does right now actually, Rippy hosted turn state tournament games yeah. there, and I'm ta not talking about, they had a state championship game, more than one, yes. two or three, um, and those were, there, were they generally, those state tournament games, were they for the fall or spring baseball programs? They were for fall. Fall program? I, I vividly recall uh, when we did some of the history, uh, how the boss was playing uh, some Eastern city, uh, Eastern uh, school, and, you know, they were coming to Little Rippy, and uh, they were 
kind of mocked about it because it was such a small town, but it was a great baseball field, even then. Yeah, it was it's a regulation field. It's not a little field. And it, it also had lights. Yeah. Right? It was one of the early fields with lights on it around the territory. Uh, I know that Council Bluffs team, Mary, was Council Bluffs Thomas Jefferson, I think. Right. It, it, Abraham Lincoln might have gotten here, but Thomas Jefferson okay. definitely did, and they were one of the juggernauts of Iowa high school baseball in this era in the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, they, I was from Shenandoah, and they used to whoop up on us regularly over there, but I always had this thought that these Council Bluffs city kids probably coming in there on charter buses, I imagine, as they usually did when they came to Shenandoah. They had charter buses and leather warm-up jackets, and getting off in Rippy, they must have thought they were on the other side of the moon. <laughs> this story goes, the folks uh, coming from a distance to Rippy uh, wanted to get something to eat, and there was Squeaks restaurant and Squeaks. Sail Barn Cafe, maybe? No. Not that early. Cool they, ball, uh, cool ball. They, the restaurant was on the outside, and I said, you know, big deal, we just want a little snack. Well, they didn't realize it was a drugstore. So it was, if you wanted something to eat, whether it was a lot or a little, that's where you ate them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were very for all. There was a drugstore for them. So, uh, still on the baseball, why, doesn't the rock outside center field say, what's it say? Rippy is a baseball town. Rippy is a baseball town. Um, it's dedicated to my dad. Is it really? The rock. Who is that? Well, teach for my dad. Yeah. So why, why is it such a baseball town and why, how did it develop that way? I passed around some postcards, Jeff. I don't think yes, I, I got you. Okay, but really, even when the coal mines were going, uh, people would uh, sponsor a big event, uh, a baseball team. And when you read the early history, they didn't have mitts. They were using bare hands for a while. Sometimes they would use gloves and they would put rags in the gloves um, and then just use um, pick out color pieces of wood that were they used for bass. And and people just came in, on Sunday afternoon to, to watch the baseball game. And so it's it had a long history of serving as a baseball community. And we'd be derelict if we didn't acknowledge that we've had lots of help from Green County, uh Grove Green County, Green County Board of Supervisors, Green County Community Foundation, uh, as well as people with strong liquor works helping financial that. You, you now have a Des Moines-based uh, adult league, with a well-organized league that's got different divisions for age groups that are playing games at Rippy now. That it's one of their fields they're using, right? Right. Uh, do you have it all have any thought at Rippy of having your own team again? <laughs> Oh, find enough people under 35. <laughs> 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 two, two of the baseball spandats of the were of the 50s era. One was yeah. Dan Peters. Yeah, you mentioned him as a basketball player, but he was a great baseball yeah, player. Yeah, he, well, he was. Uh, he really liked baseball better, and had. I think it was after he graduated from high school, had a tryout with the Milwaukee Braves and played a year, maybe or so, in the minor leagues, and then realized that that was going to be his living. Because he had played and got paid for it when he went to Morningside College, he said he could not play. Yeah. And Who was the other? Lester Zanotti. Oh, Lester. Uh, he was also a basketball player, but uh, he, uh, yeah. his, his father was the one that was still in the mining accident. But when Lester was in high school, he was quite good, and he played at the University of Iowa, and he would come back, and one of the Ricky families said it would have to be John Munson, whose father had died. And John was young and uh, Lester was very catching him. But, so Lester was in the Army then, and they had a nice baseball team. And he didn't think he would, would be quite good enough to play, but well, he was first baseman. And the first baseman who had a major league uh, background got shipped overseas, so Lester got to play first base. And uh, his sister in law, Mary Ann, kept a, a book of his uh, baseball. Uh, 
exploits and everything. Uh, so that, and, and there were lots of others that played that were good, those were the two that. Wow. And they've had, they've had programs for all ages there over the years. Lots, lots of little kids, lots of little kids. And, and, and Walt, uh, Walt Anderson was another, Walt, the field team, that's what Walt was yeah, yeah. yeah. And was Walt Anderson a banker? Yeah, yes. he was in the other bank. <laughs> but it's a more big baseball support for anything. There's a wonderful story about that. That Walt, uh, when the Des Moines Demons were well, changing their name, uh, Walt made arrangements to purchase for a dollar a piece. Pat Doherty told him that's how he was to uh, purchase the uniform. So for a while, the, the Rippy team was called the Rippy Demons because they had the Des Moines Demons uniforms. You may just mention Pat Doherty. I Pat Doherty's a well-known name in Iowa baseball. Well, he was, he, his first came, his first job after graduating from Simpson was in Griffey. He came to Baseball that. coach? Yeah. Well, wow. he, he was playing every day coach. coach in science. Yeah. Yeah. He became, he did. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. he wound yeah. up he building the baseball, the baseball Indian. program at uh, Indian Hills Community yeah. College, yeah. Yeah. Centerville yeah. Junior College in Indian Hills, and then, and then he wound up as a major league coach. Yeah. 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 He retired, he was a, uh, Person for the Colorado Rockies. Wow, amazing. Uh, kind of lightning round, rod, lightning round rod of questions here coming up. Uh, Rippy's well known for its Methodist church. Uh, it's, and food. It's, and it's food. <laughs> and, uh, I want to. You know what, what's important. Uh, <laughs> one of the coolest things that happens in college football anywhere in America happens. Are we still happening in Rippy with this? So who's going to tell this story? Because every year. With Central College in Pella, the, which is a great school, it'd be better if they didn't cheat football. But, yes. uh, but when they when they go up and play my Buena Vista Beavers up in Storm Lake every other fall up in Storm Lake, this they stop on the way back. There's a half a dozen different restaurants they could stop at, but no, they come to the Rippy United Methodist Church for a full blast meal there. How did that get started? Because Belden Demoss's sons. The great Mark Clark went graduated from Central and the and the issue. She didn't. She did. They did. Was one of was one of her sons a football player? Right. Central. Two of her sons played. Central. Actually, all three. I don't know. The four of them played. Wow, big guys though. I think. They're terribly strong. Yeah. And very athletic. And, uh, part, and part of the ritual of that is that before they leave. They stand up. They, they have suits and ties on these young men who probably don't probably wear that. Uh, and they get up and they sing the central song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the and was there a, a central cheerleader too that was involved? Her folks went to the church there, I think. Does not anybody not remember that, that? Not that I know. Okay. But that, that's one great story. But it leads me to ask, is there more than one church in Ruby now? No, there were. I passed it around a postcard that we're going to be having available. And because you guys attended, you're going to get postcards for free. But it shows the church corner and the original churches that were in. There was a Baptist church and a Church of Christ as well as the Methodist church. Oh, my. Yeah. Outlast the yeah, ball. Yeah, the was from the But that was the original. So where they put the new parsonage, <coughs> you know, block north, the church there too, wasn't there? Uh, I think there was. Originally? Maybe, I, I don't know. It was, you have it all. Uh, you also yeah, have yeah, the yeah. repeat. And I'm the not Lions sure club. if it's where the parsonage is now or if it's where Maxine Johnson is. Oh, so okay. Yes. Yes. Someone went to the not sure. Went to the, to the hard work of there's a there's a model of the old Ripley Methodist Church uh, at the part of the other fifth display and and then someone also did a model of the annex. Oh wow. Scale, what I, call the annex. I think there's one thing that we're we missed on just a little bit and that's the plowing. Oh yes, the great the national heritage. plowing matches. Yeah. We're held in Rippy, Iowa. Rippy has three plowing champions. We did a program national right here at the, at the fair a couple of years ago, and we have a couple of over there on the wall around here. Yeah, uh, the, the, it was it the national plowing championship, right? Right. And so name, name the the three that were well known from Rippy. Lawrence Huber, uh, Roger Norton, and Steve. Oh yeah. The nice seat. <laughs> ah, the uh, Lord used to stop at the radio station. He used to talk about plowing. Uh, 
and uh, Lawrence well keeps my uncle. Uh, he mentored the other two, and, and both uh, Roger and Steve well, the world matches. Yes, so. Is is there any most famous native son or daughter of Ricky that achieved an all-time high point of fame or renown for the community? Lawrence Hebert, of course. Lawrence Hebert. Uh huh. Uh, He's passed now, right? Yes, yeah. yeah, but a great person, great person, fun guy to talk to. Uh, when they had the National Pond match there, it was on Lawrence's farm. The most recent, the most recent one, yeah. And, of course, Baldwin came from all over the country. Yeah. And there was a group of farmers that came, unloaded the tractor and plowed. There's practice land, so they could practice. And dropped their plow on the ground, and their tractor stopped, and they spun and they jerked and they twisted. Pulled the plow out of the ground, loaded it back up. And up. The soils here turn that much harder wow. than what most are accustomed to. Is it because it's so rich? It has to do with clay. Uh, oh, I see. Wow. Of One of the best stories that my uncle told is that he, uh, he, he decided that he maybe should quit shaking hands with presidential hopefuls because he wanted to call him matches. So Hubert Humphrey was there, he lost, and Richard Nixon, and he lost. <laughs> uh, the, did Ricky have a newspaper? Oh, yeah, there were a number of newspapers. What, was there one that most well known? Joel Free Press. The, the Ricky page of the book. Yes. From Grand Junction, right? Yeah, there, there were a number of different papers. And the, we should say, one of the driving forces in life in Rippy in recent years, at least, has been the Friends of Rippy, right? Uh, is he still acting? We are. Um, I'm going to hand around one more set of postcards. We tried to do it just a composite, so uh, this just will we'll bring. They're very small, you have to look at them, but it, it triggers memory. So, um, and Friends of Rippy are, are doing those. But I will share, we had great fun. Uh, if any of you have not seen this, Janice Harbaugh from Jefferson here helped us get this published. And it's stories that people our age have written about their remembrances of Rippy. And so we call Excellent. it I Remember Rippy. And that, and that just came out this last year or so. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, then as part of the sesquicentennial, these are the original history of Rippy, and it was back from 1849 to 1956. At estate sales, sometimes these just go skyrocketing high because they're they're not available anymore. Now, I have to tell you, it was for a charitable fundraiser, but I saw one of these sell for $500. So mm -hmm. for that reason, we asked Janice a Harbaugh again to recreate it. And it, this is our, our, our prototype. The color is going to be green. But we are going to have these available at our sesquicentennial if anyone wow. would like to purchase them. And it's this very same information that's in here. So. It's a great, great resource for people from the future that you've taken we time to do that. Those well, are great. One of my high school friends and I, Marna Victor's partner, who now lives in Texas, she and I were deciding there should be an X-ray that I remember. Oh, <laughs> the, stories, the stories that you can't put in that still might embarrass people. <laughs> I think there should at least be a volume two for people who never got around. I, did, I agree. Uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we're going to wind up here, but a couple. Anybody got questions? You want to? Yes. I just want to say that I have heard that um, the only town in the country named Rippy is in. Uh, Our Rippy. Wow. Well, 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 and they need Rick Lee. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Dave. we have another town in Greene County that also is the only town in Iowa named, or in the United States named Peyton. Wow. Really? Amazing. You asked the question Isn't about that. Dale? Ricky Berry is the chair of Friends of Ricky. Oh. We've had a good time. <laughs> Peyton of, Place. It takes a village. <laughs> uh, I be first became aware of uh, Ricky through, I mean, in recent times, when after we moved here, I got a great introduction to Rippy from Velda DeMoss. We've mentioned her a time or two here today. She was a great citizen of Rippy and a one of the grandest characters you could ever hope to run into. And she wrote, didn't she write a column? No, for, yes. And it was called The Mouth of Rippy. <laughs> she was hilarious, but boy. And we got to remember uh, Velda DeMoss as we close this program because she was a go-getter for Rippy for sure. So, well, listen. The bike ride.
Yeah, the, of course, how we missed that? The, the Burr Ride, of course, that's uh, uh, happened for 40 some years now. The, the Ripley's hosted that the first Saturday of February. Got lost my feet on that a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but we thank you, uh, Mary Weaver, Nancy Hanneman, and Roy Bardwell. We thank you so much for coming up to the fair and having a history chat with us. And we wish you the best on the Sesquicentennial down there. Let's build a better Ripley in the future. Let, let's keep it going. Thank come, you. Come on July 31st. Yep. We'll see everybody in the Thank you all for coming.